Oh hi, I'm the heretic. This video was inspired by a conversation I had on Discord. Now, I've encountered this argument before, but it's only now I wanted to do a video about it. Anyways, when talking with some Marxists, we find common ground on one principle, that voluntarism is preferable to coercion. People acting on their own free will is ethical, whereas forcing them by gunpoint to act is not. We both understand that our relationship with the state is involuntary and therefore unethical, and because it's unethical, it's universally undesirable. Let's ignore the fact that the ten planks of Marxist communism require a state, such as requiring central banks, and just assume that these neo-Marxists reject these planks as well, for the sake of argument. So our difference, among many, is what a voluntary society would look like. For advocates for free markets such as myself, our understanding is how entrepreneurs will compete with each other to provide the best products, goods, and services for the lowest price, even if that service is worker co-ops or communes. As long as all participants voluntarily consent, then there are no problems. What the neo-Marxist concept of a voluntary society is, is not the concern of this video. Instead, I want to focus on one of their common refrains. They see a free market and balk. There is no way such a system could possibly be voluntary. After all, under free markets, or capitalism, necessities such as food, water, and shelter will cost money. Workers need to exchange their labor to employers for money. Failure to do so means they can't access what they need to survive. Thus, the argument goes that because people need to work to get past the paywall to the necessities of life, they're forced into working. Thus, it's argued, work isn't voluntary, and to call any society that has work voluntary is ludicrous. This isn't exclusive to wage labor, mind you, as entrepreneurial labor to produce goods for customers to buy or with which to barter is still a requisite for getting what you need to survive. Thus, we have what I call the work or die problem. Now, I identify it as a problem because that is how Marxists present it. The principle is that people needing to use labor to acquire what they need to survive is universally wrong and immoral. If Marxists put it forward as an ethical argument, then it has to be universally wrong. If it is not universally wrong, then arguing about it makes as much sense as arguing about your favorite movie. Can it be objectively proven that labor being needed for getting the needs for survival is unethical? First off, let's figure out what the solutions for this problem look like. If people can get what they need to survive without needing labor to gain it, then the work or die problem is solved. If people no longer require any resources for survival, then the work or die problem is solved. So, is this possible? Firstly, there's the problem of scarcity. People's desires are infinite, and we live in a finite world. The purpose of economics is to decide how best these finite resources may be allocated. There are several methods of doing this. Prices, bartering, rationing. None of them solve the scarcity problem of necessary goods. The proposed solution to the scarcity problem is post-scarcity, where goods and services are so abundant or can be duplicated so endlessly that they can meet infinite demand. The problem with post-scarcity is that it requires our civilization to have infinite energy. Recalling that matter is energy. Infinite energy, or matter, is not known to exist, and even if we did have access to some hypothetical, infinite, inexhaustible supply of energy, having access to it isn't the same as being able to use it. Imagine, if you will, a well that held infinite water, a well that refilled instantly the amount of water that you take out from it, and there was no limit to its refilling. However, you still need to extract water from that well in order for it to be useful. Naturally, you want to install water pumps to get as much water out of it as you possibly can. The problem is that it doesn't matter if you can get a pump to extract a dozen gallons a minute or a billion. The amount of water you have access to at any one point in time is limited, which actually raises a different question. 
How do we turn an unlimited resource into something useful? Who has to work, to build, to install, and operate these pumps? The question then becomes if it is acceptable for others to work on your behalf for your own survival. The short answer, no. The long answer, well, perhaps I can explain it better by expanding the work or die problem. Typically, when this argument is brought up, what they mean is you work or you die. But it must also be true that they work or they die when it is applied to other people. Otherwise, the principle is solipsistic and therefore inconsistent. So if it's always true that labor for the necessities of life is immoral, then it must also be wrong for someone else to expend their labor on your behalf to give you the necessities of life. They work or you die. Alternatively, you work or they die is also a true problem. Thus, we can demonstrate by applying logic consistently to the work or die argument that no form of economic organization can successfully solve this conundrum. We can't simply outsource the labor, since that violates the consistency principle and makes our work or die problem principle arbitrary, requiring coercion and defeating the purpose of the work or die argument. In order to solve the work or die problem, we need to get to a point where no labor whatsoever is expended. So, has this existed in the past or could it exist in the future? Well, in a state of nature, with no technological development, people must hunt and forage to get what they need to survive. Labor is expended, so this isn't appropriate. Agriculture and animal husbandry throughout history across many economic systems has existed, from feudalism to mercantilism to capitalism to the modern quasi-fascist corporatist neo-mercantilist system, labor is still needed. Under collectivist forms of communal ownership, someone still has to labor to produce the food. As pointed out earlier, they work or you die under the principle of the work or die problem. Even later, as our world increasingly turns to automation and we achieve some form of hypothetical, fully automated luxury space communism, labor is not eliminated, simply outsourced to machines, so we haven't diverted the core problem, just shifted it away from humanity. Even so, as I alluded to earlier with my infinite well of water example, someone had to build the machines, program them, test them, and extract the raw materials for their components for the chassis, the casing, all that wonderful stuff. Labor was utilized, so the use of this technology is not justified any more than property owners in the U.S. are justified in holding on to what was stolen from Native Americans, right Marxists? You still can't avoid the work or die problem. Marxists correctly identify it within market economies, but in doing so, imply their system will be able to solve this problem, but this is not true. Collective ownership, as stated earlier, still requires someone or something to engage in labor to produce food. Thus, the work or die problem is still present. Here's the thing. All configurations of society must be immoral under this principle. For Marxists to criticize capitalism for having the work or die problem makes as much sense as refusing to buy a house in Salt Lake City, Utah, because on a sunny day, the sky is blue. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, because no matter where you live on Earth, the sky will always be blue on a sunny day. That criteria will mean you never buy a house. Similarly, any principle in which it is impossible to be moral is automatically invalid. The principle being invalid means that it is justified to expend labor as a prerequisite for acquiring your needs. It means our ancestors hunting and foraging for food was justified. It means that labor in agriculture or seeking employment to buy food from the grocery store is justified. More importantly, it means the work or die problem is eliminated as a criticism of other economic systems. If there are any critiques of free markets as being compatible with voluntarism, it surely is not the arrangement by which necessities must be purchased. The fact that labor is required as a prerequisite is not evidence of oppression, any more than the fact that you feel hunger is evidence of oppression.
Nature, failing to provide your needs, doesn't mean nature is oppressing you either. But just what is oppression? To oppress means to crush or burden by abuse of power or authority. The argument of the work or die problem does have some truth to it, in the sense that there is a prerequisite amount of resources you need in a market economy to be able to acquire necessities. However, this only looks at half the picture, and assumes that the vendor is in a position of power or authority to arbitrarily withhold necessities of life. One could argue the reverse is true, that in order for the vendor to afford what they need to survive, customers are in a position of power to withhold money in exchange for their goods. Even if those goods are means of survival the vendor could utilize for himself, people need more than just one thing. A food vendor needs to use the money to buy water, a water vendor needs a house, and an architect will need to buy food, and so on and so forth. In other words, customers, could be argued, are oppressing vendors. So either the buyer or the seller are the oppressed or the oppressors. Both cannot be true. And since there is no way to establish it one way or another objectively, the oppression narrative must also be invalid. Now I also mentioned that there was another method of solving the work or die problem, that being that people would not have needs for survival. Since lizards and humans require food, water, and shelter to survive on Earth, this is clearly not the case. What would lacking needs even look like? You would not need to eat, to drink, to breathe. You could survive on most environments unaided. This isn't possible for anyone, at least at the time of this recording, making this point moot. Is it possible that at some point in the future, we might not have needed these things? Certainly. Genetic engineering might evolve people into being able to eat more easily producible food sources. Brain digitization, either into a robot body or where you exist as an avatar in a Matrix-style digital simulation might also help. Yet none of these situations avert the need for, well, needs. Organic bodies will still require nourishment, and digital bodies require energy and maintenance. We may be able to change the inputs, but the laws of thermodynamics do not permit a system that can produce an output, in this case consciousness, without any input. So at this point, the argument of the work-or-die problem has been so thoroughly debunked that nobody can continue to support it unironically without rejecting logic and reason entirely, since there is no basis by which any claim regarding the work-or-die problem can be objectively validated, enforcement of it must be arbitrary and require a coercive monopoly to enforce a subjective preference. Thus, the work-or-die solution that anyone may come up with will necessarily require a state. Since the state, by definition, requires taxation to function, which is an involuntary relationship, any philosophy that uses the work-or-die problem argument cannot, themselves, claim to be voluntarist. Those that do either speak in error and should refrain from doing so, or are sophists trying to deceive you. I already know someone is going to point out that in my example of luxury space communism, it's okay for machines to perform labor, since machines aren't people. While it's true that machines are not people, and thus do not have rights, the only way we are able to tell is because they cannot demonstrate self-ownership. For someone to make that argument, therefore, requires them to accept self-ownership as objectively valid, in which case they have no basis for rejecting property rights, which are derived from self-ownership. Making this argument on behalf of the work-or-die problem argument must argue against the self-ownership of the vendor whose use of their own labor towards the protection of necessities is implied to belong to someone else. This violates the rule of non-contradiction and is therefore invalid. Thus, either all labor is always wrong, even by animals or machines, or the work-or-die problem is contradicted by self-ownership. Actually, let's touch more on that, since so far I've just been explaining why the problem does not work, both by its own logic and what would it require. Using the framework of deontological ethics, we can safely assume that the vendors of these necessities are the rightful owners, who use their own labor to acquire the goods 
which they seek to sell. What they do with their property does not require justification. A claim to the property of another is a claim of ownership of the labor used to acquire that property. And if you own someone else's labor, that makes them your slave. A vendor putting their goods behind a paywall is not a form of oppression, but an affirmation of the rights of the individual. If people are oppressed by anything in this situation, it's hunger, which cannot burden someone through abuse of power, as hunger does not have self-ownership or agency. Scarcity, which is the impetus for the price system to begin with, is not a moral agent either. Thus, it makes as much sense to say that hunger or scarcity is oppressing someone as to say that people are oppressed by gravity. Now the question remains, how do we get people the resources they need to survive? How do we deal with scarcity? History and the science of economics has proven that the price system by which people can freely and voluntarily exchange goods and services is the best and most ethical mechanism for allocating goods and services to where they are most needed. As I and others like me have demonstrated before, property rights and the exchange thereof is the most moral system. Also, I have to say it, if you're making the work or die problem argument, your understanding of how people might require their resources to live is really limited. I mean, you assume that people can only work for an employer. They themselves can become entrepreneurs and become the employer. They might barter. They might even ask for charitable donations. They might also have savings, so they can live for years without ever having to work. So Marxists, stop trying to trap people in boxes. It's not working anymore. So the next time a Marxist says that free markets aren't voluntary because work or die, remember, the only way you can apply work or die consistently is if either zero effort is always expended to get what is needed to survive or if you don't need anything to survive. The former is absolutely impossible, even under post-scarcity, which is itself impossible. The latter requires people to literally become perpetual motion devices. Questions? Comments? Critique? Did you learn something about the work-or-die argument? Any other arguments you'd like to see me systematically dismantle? Leave them in the comments below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.